order. We must move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Question one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, in the weeks immediately following the Stormont Castle Agreement on welfare reform on the 19th of December 2014, the focus of my work and that of my officials was on the development of an executive paper which set out the main terms of the agreement and the associated costs. Sinn Féin representatives were consulted on the content of the draft executive paper as part of the normal consultation process. This uh, paper was subsequently agreed on the 22nd of January 2015 uh, executive meeting. The Stormont Castle Agreement uh, committed the executive parties to a package of support measures, including the development of a number of agreed schemes. Schemes were intended to provide the details of how the different measures would be implemented by the Social Security Agency. Preparatory work started in January of 2015, and my officials started to share the detail on the different schemes with Sinn Féin representatives from early February. From the beginning of March 2015, the level of engagement with Sinn Féin representatives increased from weekly meetings to a period during that month when discussions on welfare reform were taking place on a daily basis. I was involved in a large number of those discussions, along with my officials, who have been providing technical support to the First and Deputy First Minister in seeking to identify solutions with regards to the supplementary payment scheme. Whilst discussions have continued during April, the level of engagement between myself and my officials with Sinn Féin representatives has reduced significantly. Mr. Nesbitt, for supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister. A um, very explicit um, answer there, making clear that there were daily meetings between his department and Sinn Féin. He'll be aware the Ulster Unionist Party did not endorse the Stormont House Agreement, and one of the reasons was uh, our suspicion from past experience that there might have been a dual process and discussions not involving all five parties. Does the Minister think it's in any way acceptable that the first time three of the five parties who sat at the Stormont House Agreement uh, found out about this raft of private papers was when Sinn Féin published them? I uh, thank the member for his supplementary. Of course, the member shouldn't fall into the trap that the document that was produced by Sinn Féin ironically called Sinn Féin welfare reform the facts. Uh, and I have to say uh, that uh, a careful reading of some of the content and innuendo that was in that document will clearly indicate that it was nothing near the facts. And I, I would advise the, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party to be very careful at just believing everything that he reads that comes from that particular organisation. But mechanisms already exist through the normal consultation process by which any proposal which are to be put before the executive would be consulted upon with the other executive parties. And it has also been argued uh, and agreed that any proposed changes to the Stormont Castle Agreement would require to be agreed at the five-party leader forum, of which I understand and know that the member is uh, a part of. So Sinn Féin had particular concerns about the detail of the supplementary payment scheme and the discussions which were taking place were to identify if there were solutions within the parameters of the Stormont Castle Agreement which could address their issues. And I have to say that as someone who has been involved in this process uh, since we had what we believed was an agreement, it is extremely frustrating to be treated in the way that this House but more importantly, the people of Northern Ireland have been treated by those parties, and namely Sinn Féin, on this particular issue, the way that they have treated their own community and the rest of Northern Ireland is shameful and is something that needs to be uh, highlighted on a day and daily basis because Northern Ireland is losing out and it's because there was no agreement by one party to the Stormont Castle and the Stormont House Agreement. Call Mr Alex Maskey. Uh, could I ask the Minister, first of all, to note that it's very interesting that the member, Mr Nesbitt, has said that his party didn't agree with Stormont House Agreement, but yet he sat around the table on the day in which it was agreed and which he himself said it represented significant advances and he would recommend it to his party executive and give it a fair win. But or, or leave that one say, but would I ask the minister, would he ask the minister would he indeed confirm that he will continue to meet with our party and indeed any other party who is interested in resolving the outstanding matters on the welfare reform bill. Well, well, the member knows, and I trust that the members of this House know, that I will use and expend whatever time and effort 
uh, is to be, uh, to be engaged with and used to get an agreement on this issue. And I am open to discussions on a daily basis in relation to this matter. But I think that we need to face up to the reality. And I think the First Minister made reference uh, to this earlier, and that it is highly unlikely that we are now going to get any further meaningful discussion uh, on the issue of welfare until we have our national election on the 7th of May to the national, part, uh, the national Parliament and until we have the formation of a government at Westminster upon which we are totally dependent because I would remind all members whether they would like to accept that this is the fact or not that it will only be by the formation of a government at Westminster that we will have any finance to be able to run any department in Northern Ireland because we are totally dependent upon the block grant and the money which comes from Her Majesty's Treasury in London. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can I ask in relation to uh, future claimants and what information was sought uh, by Sinn Féin in relation to future claimants, what type of benefits that included, and whether or not you can share any information you provided to that party with the other parties in the House? Well, the member knows that uh, uh, I am more than happy to meet with her party and her representatives to discuss any of the issues which have been uh, discussed to date. And if that is uh, what she's asking, I will be more than happy to facilitate that. I think that that discussion would be meaningful and beneficial. And in terms of what the detail may emerge uh, post the 7th of May, I think that that will be dependent upon who it is that forms a government. Although I have to say, uh, having had discussions uh, with the Labour Party just uh, last week uh, when uh, they were uh, in Northern Ireland, I don't get any sense that there would be a huge uh, differential between what is the current construct of the welfare reform. I think that the uh, First Minister has highlighted the issue in relation to the bedroom tax. I think in terms of other elements of mitigations that we here in Northern Ireland uh, put in place or were proposing to put in place, I think that you could see uh, if a Labour government or a Labour coalition was to be enacted in Westminster that some of those elements would uh, be reflected in a national uh, programme in terms of welfare. So uh, more than happy to meet with the member and more than happy to discuss the issues with her party. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the commitment the Minister has given to adequately resource the advice sector in response to uh, welfare reform? And can I ask the Minister, given that the deadlock on welfare reform is costing the Northern Irish taxpayer around £2 million per week, what uh, discussions are currently taking place to make progress? And can the Minister assure the public that this issue has not been parked during the election campaign? No, I can assure the member that the issue hasn't been parked. Uh, and I pay tribute to my officials uh, who have worked tirelessly uh, during the lead up to uh, the Stormont House and the Stormont Castle Agreement over Christmas and subsequently in providing technical support and help and information to the First and Deputy First Minister. Uh, a huge amount of work has been done. And I, I think that uh, amidst all that is taking place at the moment in terms of the focus in relation to uh, the election on the 7th of May, the, the, people, the voters of Northern Ireland need to keep in mind that there was one party who pulled the rug from under all our feet and left us in a situation where now Northern Ireland is losing £2 million per week in relation to uh, the block grant. And I think that that then has to be set uh, in context with the stated aims and objects of the party opposite, that it is about protecting the vulnerable. It is about protecting those in society who are in need. I have to say, if that is the actions of a party uh, who want to be seen to be protecting the vulnerable, uh, I think that that needs to be judged against the reality for many organisations who are now feeling the pinch of the decisions that cannot be made because the money is not there. Well, Mr Jim Allen. With £564 million pounds ready, uh, supposed to be siphoned off the block grant over future years, does the Minister have any sense that it's at all possible to find any further money without doing irreparable damage to basic services by further undermining the block grant? And can he make it clear what his position is on that? I assume that the member is referring to 
uh, the overall package that was agreed. Let's remember at the Stormont Castle and the Stormont House Agreement, we had a financial uh, package that was agreed. And uh, the First Minister has made it clear that in terms of the amount of money, the amount of money is the amount of money that has been agreed. It is the implementation that has become the difficulty in terms of us working with uh, Sinn Féin and other parties. We will continue to see how we can get a resolution to that. But the member uh, makes a point in relation to the overall amount of money that would be needed. There is not uh, a bottomless pit. There is not a, a tree somewhere uh, that uh, magically produces a huge amount of money that can feed every political aspiration and every political wish list that is presented to satisfy particular parties. But we have made it clear that in terms of the agreement that we all entered into, the financial arrangements for that agreement are as they are. It is the implementation that we have been working on. And if, if we were to get an agreement uh, subject to the creation of a new government at Westminster and bedroom tax wasn't to be implemented. The only additional money that at this minute in time would be available would be the £20 million which we had set aside to mitigate already in Northern Ireland against that particular measure. Will members please note that questions 5 and 12 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Sean Lynch. Cast ever draw question 2. The number of social housing units completed in the new Fermanagh and Oma council area during this mandate from 2010-11 uh, to 2014-15 is 139 units. The housing executive is responsible for assessing the level of social housing need and determining the need for schemes in specific geographic areas and formulating the social housing programme. The Housing Executive also carry out an annual housing need assessment of all district councils in order to examine the supply and demand of new social housing. This assessment is then used to determine the Housing Executive's unmet housing needs perspectives, which identifies locations where there is general unmet housing need beyond the schemes included in the social housing development programme and where it has not been possible to secure new build sites. Housing need is identified by a number uh, deemed to be in housing stress. This is where applicants have 30 points or more on the Housing Executive's housing selection scheme. Housing need in Northern Ireland is addressed through the Social Housing Development Programme in a fair and an equitable way. Much has been achieved in addressing housing need, and there is no doubt that the serious financial challenges we face moving forward will make uh, this an increasingly difficult task. However, the delivery of social housing will remain for myself and my department and the housing executive a priority. Mr. Lynch, for supplementary. I'll get the last. Can call you. I'm going to slice the area down Fagrishian. And I want to thank the minister for his answer. And I also want to welcome the units that he already mentioned. But, minister, there's over four, 600 on the waiting list in Enniskillen and another 400 throughout the rest of the county. And I would ask you, how do you plan to alleviate this long list? Thank the member for his supplementary and also just to inform the member that uh, after questions today I will be meeting actually with the Fermanagh and Oma Council uh, to discuss uh, no doubt the uh, elements of this but also the issue in relation to their budget and, uh, and other issues that they want to bring to our attention this afternoon. Uh, the Housing Executive is working to address the housing stress levels in the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area in a number of ways. For example, housing stress is addressed most notably through the reletting of existing stock, refurbishment of void properties and the allocation of new build schemes. The number of new social homes required is based on the annual housing need assessment, which examines the supply and demand, highlighting any areas where there are gaps and predicts what will be required over a five-year period to develop the social housing development programme. And I trust that if there are any other specific areas that the member wants to raise with us, I'm more than happy to give him more detail in relation to them. Well, Mr Tom Elliott. I uh, thank the, the Minister for that update. Uh, just wondering, in, in relation to the housing stress aspect, has the, the numbers in housing stress in the Fermanagh area generally increased over the last uh, few years, or has it decreased? 
Well, the current waiting list uh, in relation to uh, the area for the member's information, at December 2014, there were 1,400 applicants on the waiting list for the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area. 774 of these applicants are in Fermanagh area, with 626 in the Oma area. 488 of the applicants on the waiting list are deemed to be in housing stress, of which 307 are in the Fermanagh area and 181 in the Oma area. I do not have how that compares uh, to the previous year. I am more than happy to provide that information to the member. Call Mr. Chris. Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he knows when the Housing Executive Maintenance Programme to install cavity wall insulation in homes at Braniel Estate, East Belfast, scheduled for October 2013, will be delivered? I don't think that question <laughs> relates to the, the main one. The Minister has choice. I, I appreciate that the member is seeking to be inventive. Uh, however, going from Braniel to Fermanagh is uh, pretty inventive, and I have to say, even, e even, even on the basis of the Alliance Party, that is really stretching the definition of being inventive. Happy to uh, get a, a written an answer to the member, and it will probably be after the 7th of May. <laughs> <laughs> I call Ms. Rosalie McCarley. Um. Uh, question number three. As with all executive departments, my department is required uh, to implement efficiencies in 2015-16, including those services provided by the voluntary and community sector. I undertook a series of formal and informal discussions with both ministerial colleagues and MLAs on the proposed allocations to particular funding streams. A transparent, robust approach was undertaken aimed at maximising the delivery of high quality services to the most disadvantaged and to ensure available funding was prioritised against the highest quality projects where successful outcomes could make a difference to people's lives. I'll miss McCarley for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, would the Minister uh, agree that the nature of the community and voluntary sector is such that it relies on a cocktail of funding from various sources, and because of that, um, there are very often adverse impacts on their services and programmes when one gets cut and they depend on one another. In that context, would the Minister agree that uh, there is a need for a clear strategic approach to this? Or am I good? Yeah, I thank the, the member for supplementary. And obviously, I would take the view that uh, what I endeavour to do in my officials in the department, and in fact, a considerable amount of work uh, was done by my officials, and, and one of the elements of that was to ensure that we cross-reference over the various uh, offices that we have within uh, the department, from the North West office right through to the Belfast offices, to ensure that we were not in any way treating any uh, particular group or organisation in a different way because of their geographical position. And I think that that led us to a position where, uh, and it's not often that uh, we get praise uh, in uh, West Belfast in the Anderson's Town News uh, from uh, the SDLP and from Sinn Féin, uh, and where there was a recognition uh, from West Belfast political representatives that while there was some bad news for community organisations from the Department for Social Development, that the cuts that have been uh, they, they have not been as bad as originally feared. And then the, the article goes on to highlight a number of issues. And the member knows that I met uh, with uh, colleagues and herself in relation to specific issues. And I do think that uh, it, it places a, a responsibility on departments to ensure that collectively, and I know this is an issue that has been raised with NICFA, but, uh, with the First and Deputy First Minister, about ensuring that there is across departmental uh, departments an approach which, doesn't have, uh, which has a positive uh, outcome for voluntary and community, as opposed to uh, one department doing one thing and another department doing something else. And we've seen that particularly in relation to a question raised earlier about uh, early years. Uh, and the Department of Education cut 1.7 million out of their budget, which has had a clear impact on community organisations, some in West Belfast and other constituencies right across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey. 
But could I ask the Minister and acknowledge in the immense contribution that the community and voluntary sector make across Northern Ireland, particularly in welfare rights, is there any evidence or indication of collaboration between organisations uh, delivering uh, projects through DSD and the community and voluntary sector? I uh, thank the member uh, and also thank the member for the work that he does in, in relation to this particular issue. I think there is many examples that are used when we come, and the, the previous member made reference to the, the issue about uh, cocktail funding, and, and it does require organisations within the voluntary community sector to be innovative in a way that they ensure the best possible financial arrangements to deliver the particular project. I think that uh, when you see a project delivered in a way that has brought about collaboration, I think it enhances the project. It also brings a particular challenge, and that is, as we have already seen to date in some areas, when one element of that funding arrangement is not actually in place or is removed, then it could potentially have a long-term effect as to whether or not that project actually survives. And I made reference to the issue, for example, of preschool uh, places. I have some preschool provision in my own constituency that are now facing uh, a very, very bleak situation, not because money wasn't available from other elements of government, but because the money that has been removed from the Department of Education probably was a cornerstone to that uh, money being used for that organisation, if it's not there, the viability of those organisations becomes very tenable or untenable, and ultimately some projects would uh, close as a result of that. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. And he referred to having conversations with other ministers. Did he have any conversations with the Employment and Learning Minister in regard to the European Social Fund and how now some sectors within the vulnerable community sector will actually loss out in funding, like the women's sector, those not, young people not in employment, education and training? I uh, thank the member and, and the chair of the, the committee. He will be well aware that this has, has become a, a particular problem. And indeed, in discussions with some of the organisations which came to see us in the lead up to us making a, a decision in relation to the budget, and I should have said earlier that I am sorry that it took so long for us to get to the point where we made the announcement, but that came about as a result of a variety of discussions which we had uh, with. Uh, uh, organisations to give some sense of where they would be post the announcement that we would make. And I can confirm that we had consultation and discussion with the Minister in relation to the elements of ESF, which has ultimately now resulted in some organisations having severe uh, difficulties and severe financial problems. Call Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister tell us if the budget for supporting people uh, will be affected? I, I thank the member uh, and welcome him to uh, yeah. question time uh, and uh, look forward to working with him. And I know that he will continue to do, as he has done uh, as an elected representative on the, the council in Londonderry, a, a good uh, job of work for the people that he represents. And I look forward to working with him uh, in the weeks and months ahead. In relation to supporting people, uh, I think that uh, it's clear that we have endeavoured uh, in terms of the Supporting People programme uh, to do all that we could to protect supporting people. And the funds of a number of community sector organisations providing housing support services to very vulnerable people in our society is supported through the Supporting uh, People programme. And I've protected, as far as possible, the Supporting People budget for 2015-16, which will secure the delivery of those housing support services uh, by the voluntary and the community sector. And indeed, uh, on, and this wasn't the reason, I have to say, uh, why I was keen uh, to ensure that supporting people was protected. But on the day that uh, I was uh, appointed as Minister for Social Development, I think it was the 24th of September, members will recall that there was a lobby came to the Assembly and as dutiful MLAs we all went out and got our photographs taken to ensure that we were supporting that particular campaign. Little did I know that that afternoon I would be responsible for that budgetary head. So maybe the lesson to learn from that particular experience is always be careful of the photographs that you get uh, yourself into. But I believe supporting people plays a, a vitally important role, a very important role in terms of many aspects 
of ensuring that people have floating services or the 80 per cent of the money that goes towards uh, the, the housing element of the scheme. And I think it's invaluable. It's something that I want to protect going into the future and trust that we can build upon the success of supporting people as a scheme. Call Mr. Mickey Brady. Chester Cahar, question four. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the member is aware or should be aware that a system of selling social houses to existing tenants is currently in place in Northern Ireland in the form of the house sale scheme. Uh, the house sale scheme gives eligible tenants of Northern Ireland Housing Executive or registered housing associations the right to buy their property from their landlord at a discounted rate to the normal market value. The initial discount for house sale schemes at present is set at 20 per cent of the market value, increasing by 2 per cent for each additional completed year of tenancy to a maximum of 60 per cent or £24,000, whichever is lower. Mr. Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister what consideration has he given to stopping the ongoing sell off of publicly owned housing? I think that uh, this is an issue that, uh, in terms of, I suppose, coming from the member's political background, and I saw his colleague who's beside him uh, has made comment on this issue about particular concerns around the housing executive. Uh, and uh, that there would be some plan afoot that at some stage uh, it is my intention uh, to have the housing executive put into some new arrangement that would take it outside the, the public uh, ownership. I have to say that since I've come into post, I've endeavoured to build a working relationship with the housing executive, very cognizant of the fact that they, they have in the past done a very good job. Uh, they are not like any organisation that hasn't had their difficulties and challenges, and they've had. But I want to ensure that we have in Northern Ireland good quality homes. And I don't believe that that will be provided for with just having one size fits all. And I will endeavour to work with the housing executive to ensure that, for example, as has been already highlighted by his colleague, that the request that has come to me via the housing executive board, that they should be given powers or additional powers uh, to borrow money and therefore being able to be in a better place to do uh, a better job, then I think those are uh, issues that we are uh, seriously considering at the moment and I trust with uh, the uh, help of this Assembly very soon to be in a position to give assurance uh, to the housing executive, to their tenants and to the people of Northern Ireland that we are not in the business of selling off. Uh, but what we are in the business of doing is ensuring that we get the best possible outcome for our tenants to deliver the best possible homes for the people of Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that, first of all, the purchase of homes by tenants is popular, and secondly, releases capital which is tied up? in houses which are not available to, for, the, for public uh, dispersal anyhow at present? And would he? reject the left-wing state-controlled ideology of Sinn Féin that wants to see people dependent on the public sector rather than have the freedom to own property that, if, if they so wish to. As always, you can depend upon the, the member for uh, East Antrim to, to set a particular issue in its context, and, and I agree with the member. I think that what we have to have is a, a mix of provision that does not restrict those people who want to uh, advance and own their, home, their own home, but equally to have a system whereby where there, are, where there is not the opportunity for people to do that, that they still have access to good quality homes. And, and I keep repeating this, uh, and I trust that it will uh, be something that uh, is eventually taken up by uh, parties in this House and also by the public. And, and that is, we, we often refer to here about building houses, and I have said this in this house before, it should be about building homes. And, and I have seen in communities where you have a, a, a mixture of provision, whether it's uh, private or social or whether it's co-ownership, wh whatever uh, the provision or whoever the provider is, the one thing we need to ensure 
that it is quality homes and they are fit for purpose. And the sad reality is, uh, and very shortly I will be bringing to uh, the DSD committee and also to this House the outcome of the Savile uh, investigation and the Savile survey. Uh, that was carried out. And I think that when we see the detail of that particular report, I think it will clearly indicate to us there's a huge amount of work and money is going to be needed to bring the existing housing executive stock, stock up to a level that we, any of us would be happy with in this modern day and this modern age. Order. That ends the period for list of questions. I have to tell you that uh, the member has withdrawn their name for topical question six. And I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Uh, Cormac, good, uh, yes, uh, you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister why there has been such a delay in uh, dealing with the housing executive workers' pay increment? Well, obviously, the, the issue in relation to that is a matter for ourselves and the board, and I hope to be in a position whereby we will be able to have that matter resolved uh, within a matter of weeks. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. I will ask and could I thank the Minister for his answer. But just Minister, could you clarify or outline what engagement you have had with DFP in relation to this matter? And also can you outline a timeline for for the resolve of this matter? Well I think in all of these things it remains a matter whereby we have to engage with the DFP in the processes that we have and I will write to the member and give him a written answer in terms of the timeline. Mr. Fram, can for a topical question. I will ask Kieran Collier and uh, thank the Minister for his uh, answers up to uh, date. Can the Minister give, uh, give me an update on the empty home strategy, uh, which includes private and social, and explain what has been done uh, to bring these houses into use uh, to deal with the lengthy waiting lists? I thank the member, and obviously the member, when it comes to these issues of housing, is someone who uh, always endeavours to uh, keep uh, a watching brief in relation to uh, this issue. I am concerned about uh, the ongoing uh, work that needs to be done with the uh, housing executive and with other organisations that ensures, and it goes back to the point that I made earlier on, about how we engage with these organisations, that they, they suddenly do not come to a point where they believe that they are involved in some meaningless process, but that actually there is a focus upon them ensuring that they deliver for their uh, tenants. And in terms of the work that my department is doing, we continue to work with the executive and with other organisations to ensure that whether it is the issue of empty, empty homes or whether it is the issue of uh, maintenance, that they are well aware of their requirements to do what they can within the budgetary uh, envelope that has been given for them to deliver those services. And Mr McCann for supplementary. And I, I can thank the Minister uh, for, for his response. Uh, but uh, the week before last uh, was World Homeless Day. Uh, there was a number of events that were held uh, the, throughout the city of Belfast on Saturday. There was a number of organisations that had a march to the city hall, and yet only yards uh, from where that march took place. There are hundreds of apartments that have been lying empty uh, for quite a number of years uh, that, if brought back into brought into use, uh, would help uh, deal with some of the serious problems that there is, uh, not only of, as homelessness, you know, and, and many people who have a, 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 a I really need a question shortly. But I'm asking the Minister, uh, how can you deal with uh, landlords who have hundreds of homes or apartments land or that can be brought back into use uh, to deal with the homelessness issue? Uh, thank you. In terms of the housing executive and the housing associations, uh, I think that it would be true to say that they remain committed to moving tenants into available homes uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the standard tool of measurement for the process is the proportion of empty stock or voids at any given time. And quickly moving people from the waiting list into homes once they become available is reflected in a lower proportion of empty homes. The target for void management of social housing is uh, 4%. Per cent. And overall, Northern Ireland voids management of relevant social housing uh, providers. So I, I agree with the member in terms of uh, we need to do all that we can. And uh, I saw some comments that were making the assertion that somehow 
uh, we were taking this issue, or we weren't taking this issue seriously. I take it very seriously to ensure that we are doing all that we can, whether it is people uh, who are deemed as homeless, whether it is people who are, as we know, uh, in terms of housing stress, or in particular areas where there are certain challenges to uh, getting a, a better return in terms of, of the overall waiting list, that we will continue to do all that we can. And I give the member that assurance because I think that there is a responsibility, and he's absolutely right, in relation to landlords, but I think it's a collective responsibility in all our parts to do all that we can to encourage and facilitate a resolution to this issue. Call Mr Ian Mill. Uh, Minister, with 25.24% reduction in DSD funding uh, for urban regeneration, uh, Mid Ulster has been the hardest hit. Uh, can the Minister explain the criteria that was used to determine this? Well, I think that the member, in terms of, and it goes back to the comments that I made earlier on in relation to uh, the issue regarding. Uh, the amount of money that was given to us. Uh, obviously, the member has to appreciate that uh, what, we, what we had given to us was a reduction in the overall amount that we previously had, had and that was going to have a particular impact on uh, the, out, the rollout of uh, neighbourhood renewal and, indeed, uh, if we'd had uh, the agreement by his party to have that issue uh, rolled out on the 1st of April, it would be the local councils that would have been dealing with this issue as opposed to my department. However, uh, a failure to get agreement on that and, and his party not trusting their own councillors to maybe be able to administer that uh, is an issue that they have to uh, explain to their own elected representatives. But I think the rationale that we used was we looked, for example, at uh, areas that were outside neighbourhood renewal. We looked at issues as to whether or not uh, it had uh, given value for money. We looked at issues uh, such as uh, the way in which uh, the project may have been time-bound, and in fact, as a result of that, uh, some projects did not continue because the allocation of funding was coming to an end. Well, Mr Millen, for supplementary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Given that the Minister has stated that the regeneration of Marrowfield Town is an centre as an ongoing commitment of his department. Uh, can you outline there what impact uh, this substantial cut will have on the likely uh, future progress of, the, of this? Uh, I thank the member and I have, I have met with the representatives from uh, the Macrofeld area and uh, the new council. And, uh, I do not believe that we will see uh, any long-term uh, long-term disadvantage to the uh, amount of money that was being allocated, because I think that the new council will endeavour to ensure that uh, that money is spent in a way which gives us a good outcome in Macrofelt and in other areas within the new council boundaries. Well, Mr Jim Allister for a topical question. Is the Minister and his apartment planning this year again to provide a grant to Belfast Pride? Uh, in terms of the allocation of funding, uh, I approve the continuation of the Belfast City Event Community Activity Grants uh, for the financial year of 2015-16. My department has allocated a budget of £220,000 to the Belfast City Centre Event and Community Activity Grants for the financial year 2015-16, uh, and this represents a reduction of some 80,000 in the amount that has been available in, in recent years. The grant schemes were previously known as the Lag Inside Event and Community Activity Grants. However, in April uh, 2013, the uh, applicable boundary was extended to take in the city centre and were renamed the Belfast City Centre Event and Community Activity Grants. A call for applications for the Belfast City Centre Event Grant Scheme was made on the 9th of April 2015, with the closing date of the 23rd of April of this year, and the Department have received 34 applications. These applications will be assessed over the coming weeks, with the decision, the decision on funding will be issued in due course. And I have to say that included in that, those applications, as had been the previous years, is uh, Orange Fest. Yeah. I call Mr Alistair for supplementary. Does Belfast Pride included in those applications 
and does the minister anticipate again giving funding and does he think it's a prudent use of a quarter of a million pounds in these times of austerity to sustain events such as this? I have not uh, personal sight of the applications and that process will be carried out uh, by the Belfast City Centre Events Grant Scheme and they are the administrators for the scheme and it is up to them to decide in relation to the process that will be used and the allocations that will be made. Mrs Karen McEvitt is not in her place. Number six, remember, was withdrawn. I call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how much did the benefit uptake programme generate last year? I thank the member for uh, the uh, question. I'm committed to promoting the uptake of uh, benefits in an effort to tackle uh, poverty and to, improve the po the, uh, and to improve lives for those who are most vulnerable. In 2013-14, over 4,000 people, many of them older people, gained uh, 14.2 million uh, in the new and additional benefits. And in fact, since 2005, benefit uptake work has generated over 81 million in additional income for people in Northern Ireland. This is additional income for uh, people in Northern Ireland. And I think that that proves the worth of this particular programme and is something that I'm committed to ensuring is continued in the future. Call Mr McQuillan for supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? I think 81 million over, over five years is a, a big turnaround. But Minister, how does your department pr promote the uptake of benefits? Uh, thank the, the member for supplementary. The, my department has four separate but complementary strands of activity to generate additional benefits for harder to reach groups of people. And these include uh, writing out to over 25,000 individuals identified from benefit data sets, encouraging them to have a full benefit entitlement check and to ensure that they are not missing out on any benefit supports or services to which they may be entitled. Uh, Make the Call is the regional advertising and promotion campaign which is endorsed by the Commissioner for Older People, the community outreach officers who are based throughout Northern Ireland and who deliver benefit uptake activity by visiting vulnerable claimants in their own homes and carrying out benefit entitlement checks and assistance with claims and making and form uh, filling. They also provide a valuable service to local communities by delivering community promotional events and uh, clinics redundancy support to business and individuals and taking referrals from a wider range of partners. There is also the Innovation Fund and the partnership working in, with the Atlantic Philanthropies and my department funded community-based organisations to trail new innovative approaches to improving benefit uptake. Full evaluation of this approach will also be available in the summer of 15. So I think that that gives the, the member, I trust, some overview of the various ways in which we endeavour to promote the uptake of benefits via the writing to people, make the call, and the community outreach officers. Call Mr. Cahill Washington for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister to really detail what protections are in place to ensure that new councils uh, will not be able to use the financial package provided uh, to deal with social need for other purposes? Yeah, I thank the member, and I think the member raises a very valid point. Uh, the answer to that maybe lies with his colleagues in the Social Development Committee who are currently uh, looking at the Regeneration Bill. And I think that uh, I await uh, to see what the outcome of the deliberations of the committee are. I have listened to some comments that have already made to me in regards to the definition or the lack of definition of uh, social need, and I think we need to ensure that the title of the bill is reflected in the activity of the Council, and that is the bill is currently called and now remains the case the, uh, the Regeneration Bill, and I think it needs to be a focus on those aspects of regeneration which benefits society and benefits community. Call Mr. Washington for supplementary. Uh, good morning. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can the Minister tell us how best he could probably ring fence uh, that funding for social need within the Regeneration Bill? I, I think that by setting down certain criteria and maybe giving uh, in the Bill uh, guidelines or, or guidelines following on as a result of the progress of the Bill, then that would be the template that the councils would be asked to use to ensure 
And the specific purpose for which the money is given is actually the purpose for which the money is used. Order. Time is up. Members will wish to take the reason. Sorry, can I finish first, please? Members will take their ease while we change the table. I'll take the point of order. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Very grateful to you. I would be grateful if you would review Hansard for the remarks by Mr. Maskey about me, where he, if I heard him correctly, he implied that at the Stormont House talks, I said that I would take the agreement and recommend it to my party executive. That is not true. He knows it's not true. We should, I assure you agree, Mr. Speaker, we should use this chamber respectfully, not as the set of Jack and Nori. Well, it seems the member has clarified the point. Of course, we can view uh, Hansard. Sometimes, though, it would be useful if members who are not speaking would remain silent, and then perhaps the person in the chair might hear better what's going on.